Shake the mountains, break the walls apart, open the heavens, Almighty God, you are overcomer, defender of my heart. It's who you are, God of my power, the oceans open wide, your fire falls down. Yeah. 
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Certainly good to see you all here in God's house this morning on this beautiful, though cold, uh, uh, spring day. And uh, uh, today, uh, just a couple things. Don't forget to pick up a bulletin. It has all the goings-on of the church and announcements in it, and also our prayer list, too. And uh, also, it's, uh, it's good to be back uh, after being gone a couple of weeks, being out sick, but uh, it's good to be back in church again. And uh, today we are going to be celebrating communion a little later, and uh, so be prepared for that. And at this time, if our uh, if our deacons will come forward, we'll receive our morning offering. And as they're coming forward, I'd like to read to you uh, from a book of Psalms. This is Psalm 51. It says, "Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness." According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Shall we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this wonderful, beautiful day that you've gifted us with. And I thank you, Lord, for each person who's here in your house today, also for those who are joining us online as well. And Father, we just pray that your spirit be among us at this time as we worship you, as we give you praise, as we give you the honor that you so, that you so deserve. And Father, without you, we are nothing. And Father, we uh, we dedicate these tithes and offerings to you this morning, knowing that you're the one who, who gives us all things, who gives us life itself. And Father, I pray you bless the giver, and may these offerings be multiplied in your service. I ask these things in the wondrous name of Jesus. Amen.
The next song we're going to sing is, this is a move. Uh, we have to change a little here. But I wanted to share, I don't, I've been doing some research for Sunday school lesson. I don't know, anybody hear about the church, uh, the school Asbury? It was in the news in February. Some people did. Well, it was a school that, after their service, they started continuously praising the Lord. Uh, it was just a normal Wednesday service, but it ended up not stopping when it was supposed to stop. It just continued, and it continued for weeks that they continued praising. Well, obviously, people went and go. It's not like somebody stayed in there forever. But, but it was these students, these, these Gen Xers or whoever they call them now, these Gen Zers, is that what they're called? That people are saying that are the ungodly generation that we have. They are the generation that probably has walked away from the Lord the most out of all generations in the history of the world. But it was great to see that. It's great to see this thing in Asbury. And maybe it's a move that is of coming back to the Lord. So we always need to try to do that to, to keep. Now, there's word whether it's a revival or not. I guess you have to wait to see. And, and people are speculating over the word. But, you know, it was. It was an outpouring of love, praise, and, and worshiping the Lord. And, and I think it needs to be honored in that also. Uh. So if you stand and uh, sing with us, we're going to do This is a Move. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being Set our hearts. 
So the last song we're gonna do is uh, it's called Make Room. And uh, I think it's uh, something that we need to get back to. Um, we keep letting everything today on the news get in the way of our worship and get in the way of our thoughts and it's taking a lot of people away from God. So this song is just reminding us to make room and keep God first in our lives. So. And here is where I lay it down. Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender And here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender And I will make room
Thank you for every blessing that you pour into each one of our lives. Father God, we are so we are so humbly thankful for it all. And Lord, forgive us that we don't give enough attention to you, Father God. Forgive us that we don't give enough praise to you. Lord, forgive us that we fall into error and we don't follow you enough. We don't have enough you of you in our lives. Father God, I pray that that we all will make more room for you. God, it's what you call us to do. We are to love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And we can't do that if we don't make enough room for you. Dear God, we love you. We praise you always in Jesus' name. Amen. give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, whose willingness to give his body on the cross and to spill his blood so that we may have hope in the future to continue your plan for each and every one of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. While they're uh, passing out the cup this morning, I'd like to read in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. I think this is a, a fitting verse for today especially. And for a lot of people, they don't quite understand what we do here. We celebrate once a month only to remind us of just what Jesus gave for each and every one of us. And we do that for a reason. We're all very forgetful people. We tend to live our lives working in the world and traveling around and being beat up every week by what's going on around us. And we need to sit down, just like the song says, give everything back to God and change our minds, calm our spirits, and let it remind ourselves that God has a plan, and it was through his son, Jesus Christ. His willingness to give what he gave is a tremendous hope for each and every one of us. And that's why we celebrate this once a, once a month, just to remind us and to encourage us that we can keep going, that there is a plan, that the world doesn't win.
Each will take the cups that you've been passed out. On the top side will take the bread out. All partake of the bread together. You'll turn it over, the cup, cup side. I'll partake of the cup together. First of all, thank you for to those who served us communion just now, and also to our worship team as well, leading us in praise this morning to our God. And uh, at this at this time, let's uh, dismiss our junior church. Let them head on out. We got a gob of kids there. Got to get out of here. So, <laughs> and. Uh, as they're on their way out, let's uh, turn, in our, turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 17. The book of Luke, chapter 17. A thankless job, unappreciated, taken for granted. You know, there are people in our lives that we depend upon who are often unsung heroes. You know, for instance, when you call for an ambulance, you're in that position, you need to call for an ambulance. You expect that ambulance to arrive even if it's in the middle of a tornado. When you call for the police, you, when your life is in danger, you expect, just expect them to show up and to jump into a dangerous situation. When your house is on fire, you expect the fire department will soon be coming down your driveway. We just expect those things. You know, when our, our nation fights a war, we expect the members of our armed forces to go and put their lives on the line for us. You know, these are often the unsung heroes that risk our lives for you. They put their lives on hold just for you. And you know, you think about it, sometimes we just take them for granted. 
but at least they deserve our thanks and a praise for a job well done. So let's not take them for granted. And it got me to thinking, you know, in the same way, let's not take our Lord Jesus Christ for granted. He gave his life that you might live, that you might have hope. He gave his life not only for you, but that he might save the whole world. And that's no small thing. So let's not take our Lord Jesus Christ for granted. You know, uh, let's read from Luke chapter 17. And I'll start reading at verse 11. It says, While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men stood at a distance to meet him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray before we continue. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that we can be in your house this day, that we can look into your word and see an example of, of praise and worship and thanksgiving. Father in heaven, I, I just pray now that we may have hearts that are thankful, hearts that readily worship and give praise to you. I ask you now, Lord, that you would cleanse me, that you would forgive me of my sins, that I may be worthy to proclaim your word to your people. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus was determined. Jesus was, and you might ask, what was Jesus determined to do? Well, he was on his way to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, destiny awaited him. You know, there was an obvious shift in the Gospel of Luke back in, and I pointed this out to you before in other sermons, in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It says, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Another translation put, says it this way, that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so this is part of that journey as he's making his way to Jerusalem. So Jesus was deliberately, deliberately, by choice, going to Jerusalem, knowing that the cross awaited him there. He knew what would happen to him there, what they would do to him there. So Jesus crossed through the borderlands that lay between Galilee and Samaria, and he entered one of the many villages that dotted the landscape. Jesus and his disciples, as he, they entered this one village, uh, beheld an unusual sight, if you think about it. Ten leprous men stood at a distance to meet him. They dared not approach Jesus, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. They dared not approach Jesus directly, but they stood at a distance shouting at the top of their voices, 
Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And it would have been sort of a novel sort of scene, perhaps even comical in a sense, with the lepers yelling to Jesus, and Jesus shouting back, Go show yourselves to the priests. And they say, what? What did you say? Go show yourselves to the priests. You know, we've discussed leprosy in part already in our study of the Gospel of Luke. Way back in chapter 5, a leper begged Jesus to make him clean. You know, in our society, we don't really have any first-hand experience with leprosy, and thank God for that. You know, few of us have actually seen a leper. You might wonder if leprosy still even exists. I understand it exists in some third-world countries still, but you know, modern antibiotics and things like that have really eliminated leprosy. But in Bible times, leprosy was common enough. It was common enough, something that was feared. It could be a devastating and even a fatal disease. There were also, interesting enough, there was some mild cases of leprosy and there could be more severe forms of leprosy. Leprosy began on the skin and in the worst cases could work itself deep into the flesh, affecting the fingers, the nose, the ears, rotting away some parts of the body even. It was also known to be very contagious, and it demanded a long-term quarantine. Even the ancients understood this. And those diagnosed with leprosy were compelled to live away from their family and their community at large. They actually lived kind of at the margins of society, kind of as reflected here. They were just outside the village. They weren't inside the village. They had to warn others of their presence by crying out, unclean, unclean. And if they didn't die for the inf in the effect from the infection of leprosy, it was actually possible that someone might uh, uh, actually recover from leprosy after an extended period of time. If the disease faded away, the leper then was required to go and show himself to the priest. In this case, the priest served as kind of a health inspector. And the priest then would confirm that they had recovered from leprosy and declare the unclean now clean. And the leper then could re-enter society. So the leper longed for the day when and if he could show himself to the priest and get that clean bill of health. So they cry out to Jesus at a distance, have mercy on us. And Jesus commanded, you shouted back, go show yourself to the priests. Well, what's implied by that command? Well, if the, the ten men would take a leap of faith and go show themselves to the priest they would be healed. So this little band of lepers, these ten men, made a leap of faith. They just went ahead, even though they were still afflicted with leprosy, they made that leap of faith to go show themselves to the priest. And they began their journey to find a priest, perhaps there was one in that village, trusting then that they would be found clean. And it's an act of faith that we can't take away from any of the ten. And on this journey, they all of a sudden realized our leprosy's gone. That they had been cleansed. And they were not merely healed in here, but it says they were cleansed. Their exile would now be over. Now, why were the ten lepers together? You might ask that question. Well, the ten might travel together for the sake of companionship because they, they could relate to one another. Or they may have traveled together for the sake of self-protection. 
And usually these ten acted as one, but not in this case. One of the lepers, realizing that he had been cleansed, turned back. He turned back and he went back to Jesus. He came to Jesus with praise on his lips. It says he was glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face before Jesus while giving thanks. Luke notes something about this man in Luke chapter 16, verse 16. 17, verse 16. He says he was a Samaritan. This Samaritan was outside of the fold of Judaism or Israel. Yet he is the only one who returned with praises and thanksgiving. And Jesus here is a bit perplexed. He asks in seven, chapter 17, verses 17 and 18, he says, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned glory to God except this foreigner? Now, it's interesting. Jesus called this, the Samaritan this foreigner. It's curious. That word foreigner was also the same word inscribed on the temple gates in Jerusalem. It's interesting, they, in, in the temple, well, there's a part of the temple that excluded, on the gates of the temple, it said that they, uh, foreigners could not enter into that part of the temple. And that inscription forbade any but an Israelite from entering the temple to worship. And that's the same word that Jesus uses here as a foreigner. So foreigners were not allowed to worship in the temple there. And so in a bit of a twist of irony, now it's only the foreigner who's returned to worship the God who sent the, Jesus the Messiah. The other lepers went on their merry way without thinking about returning to give thanks. It's interesting, the people of Israel failed to worship while the foreigner gave praise and worship to the God of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus, I don't think, is trying to condemn his own people here, but rather Jesus is challenging them how to give praise, how to give thanks, how to have gratitude. And he was encouraging them to recognize that even what a, even a foreigner could recognize, that God was working through Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, I think, also was anticipating the gospel message of salvation that would be spread not only to the nation of Israel, but also to Samaria, and also even to the ends of the earth. For many people would be moved by the message of salvation. It's interesting, sometimes outsiders can see the work of God when the insiders cannot. Jesus gave the former leper a blessing in Luke chapter 17, verse 19. And he tells him, to stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, what about the other nine? Now, someone might wonder if the miracle was withdrawn from them because of their lack of gratitude. But I don't think that God works in that way. I want you to think about it for a moment. God blesses each one of us daily. Amen? He blesses us daily, every one of us. The scriptures say that God even sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Upon the righteous and the sinner, God sends the rain. And every person upon this earth receives daily blessings from God. Every person on this earth receives a daily blessing from God. The sunshine, the air, food in our stomachs. And it's true, you know, each of us have been given life. We have breath in our lungs. We have food to eat. We have sunshine on our heads. So if God blesses every 
every person on this earth every day. And God has also sent His Son that we have, might have life eternal. And it's not just for a small minority, it's for everyone. For God so loved the world, you remember? Yet, this is the strange twist of fate. It's only a small minority, perhaps one in ten, that returns to give God glory. It's only that small minority that thinks to give God worship and praise for all that He does. And today we gather here to give God that praise and that worship and that thanks for all that He's done for us. And so, may you have the eyes to see what that one saw, that God was at work and that God is to be praised. This time, uh, let's uh, have our worship team come on back up and, and lead us in a, a closing song. He's worthy to be praised. The song that we're going to sing is called Good, Good Father. You'll stand and sing it with us.
Shall we pray together? Our Father, you are a good, good Father. And Father, you love each person here. You love each person that's joining us online, who's listening to our service today. And Father, your, your love is steadfast. And it's always there. And Father, we just give you the praise and the honor and the glory. I ask these things in Jesus. Amen.